Good morning. Good morning. And welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus. It's good to be here this morning with God's uh, people and uh, to see you again and just want to encourage you to continue to stand in, in the Word of God. And I think the first time I was here was 2010. There was about at least, a, preached at least 12 different churches that I recently formed or pulled under the ELCA. Am I a little too hot? Yeah. I'm okay, okay. Uh, just briefly looking at announcements, and you can tell me if something uh, else uh, needs to be announced, but I uh, want to encourage you, men's Bible study at uh, breakfast, Maple Manor Cafe, it's good to get together as men and good together uh, to have fellowship and to be in the Word of God, I want to encourage that. And then the next Monday, the 16th, council meeting, Lemoyne, turning 80, where's Lemoyne? <laughs> there you are, okay. Wow, you've got a couple years out of me. Nine of them. But congratulations, and uh, you'll have a, a brunch being served October 15th in your honor. Are there any announcements that need to be kind of emphasized for the congregation? Let's begin our worship service with standing. Please stand. And on page 732, How Great Thou Art. Read him in seven. I mean, excuse me, 532. How great thou art.
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Most merciful God, we, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Our Heavenly Father has had mercy on us and sent His one and only Son to be the propitiation, the payment for our sins. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And in Jesus' name, and in his death, I proclaim to you the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And turn in your green hymnal, 376, Your Kingdom Come.
Okay, can everybody hear me okay? We uh, are so happy to have Pastor Foles with us today, and uh, uh, we pray for uh, Pastor Nick Hensler and his wife Lori, as they're off. They mentioned something about going to the Norwegian Riviera, wherever that is. <laughs> <laughs> so good luck on that one, okay? <laughs> Today's reading then um, is from Daniel 12, <coughs> verses 1 through 13, our first lesson. At that time, Michael, the archangel who stands guard over your nation, will arise. Then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since nations first came into existence. But at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. But you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret. Seal up the book until the time of the end, when many will rush here and there, and knowledge will increase. Then I, Daniel, looked and saw two others standing on opposite banks of the river. One of them asked the man dressed in linen, who was now standing above the river, How long will it be until these shocking events are over? The man dressed in linen, who was standing above the river, raised both his hands toward heaven and took a solemn oath by the one who lives forever, saying, It will go on for a time, times, and half a time. When the shattering of the holy people has finally come to an end, all these things will have happened. I heard what he said, but I did not understand what he meant, so I asked, How will all this finally end, my Lord? But he said, Go now, Daniel, for what I have said is kept secret and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, cleansed, and refined by these trials. But the wicked will continue in their wickedness, and none of them will understand. <laughs> Only those who are wise will know what it means. From the time the daily sacrifice is stopped, and the sacrilegious object that causes desecration is set up to be worshipped, there will be 1,290 days. <clears throat> and blessed are those who wait and remain until the end of the 1,335 days. As for you, you, as for you, go your way until the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will arise again to receive the inheritance set aside for you. Join me now in the reading of the Psalm, Psalm 16. I'll read the uh, odd and join, join me in the evening <clears throat> verses. Also on pages 220 and 221 in your green hymnal. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is upon the godly that are in the land, upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. Their libations of blood I will not offer nor take the names of their gods upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not fall. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Our second lesson comes to us from 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 11. <coughs> Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you, for you know quite well that, that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are children of the light and of the day, and you don't, and we don't belong to the darkness and night. So be on your guard. 
not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is a time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing. This ends our second lesson. Would you please rise as you're able for the gospel? Jesus, you go to heaven 
when you die. A teacher said, well, how do you know there is a heaven? The little girl says, well, if I die, I'll try to get word to you and tell you about heaven. The teacher asked, well, what if I die first? Well, then you can tell me about hell. <laughs> I love stories about children, and Jesus said we're to have the faith of a child. They believe the things they're told. How important it is to teach our children the truth of the Bible from a very early age. Uh, children are very honest and direct, and I think sometimes their directness offends us, offends adult sensitivity. But Jesus was just as direct as this child was about the truth of heaven and hell. It's amazing, don't we live in a society and they're being a direct, uh, they're called right wrong, and we should accept all this perversion, a sexual perversion, and not be offended by it, and it seems like our society has uh, no shame in saying that, and yet sometimes they shame us for speaking the truth, that God will judge sin. We're going to look at Jesus today, we're going to look at what's on Jesus' heart, and because I think that's about most important, because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and you are followers of Jesus Christ, you chose to follow his word, and not tradition. You, follow, you chose to hold on to the Bible, and not tr traditions that are falling away from God. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, what's on Jesus' heart should also be on your heart, it should be on my heart. Jesus was very straightforward about eternity. He's at the beginning, he's asked a question, a very simple question. Lord, are only a few people saved? And he didn't blush to give an answer. He gave a very straightforward answer about heaven and hell. He revealed two uh, crucial, three crucial truths about eternity that the church has always believed and the church has always to proclaim. First of all, he revealed that only a few people will be saved. Make sure you're one of them. Only a few, not many, not everyone, but Bible teaches only a few. Jesus said the same thing earlier in his ministry, recorded in Matthew 7. He said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is a gate and broad is a road that leads to destruction. And many, not few, many enter that way. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And this is totally contrary to the spirit of our age, isn't it? Unfortunately, the church has become apostate, and the church, much of the church now teaches the spirit of our age. They teach what popular, what's politically correct, instead of what Jesus teaches. But Jesus teaches that few would be saved. And there's only one way to salvation, and that's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Now he's not talking about striving to earn salvation, but be very sure that you're walking through the way of salvation, that the only way that God has opened, and that's through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. The Greek word is often used uh, in athletic competition. Make every effort to cross the finish line. Strive, give it your all. And we're to make every effort to make sure we're on the right path that we know Jesus Christ. The door is pictured, by the way, that is pictured, the kingdom of God is pictured of a house. And there's only one way into that house, a very narrow path, very narrow gate. And there's only one way, and if you want to enter that house, you need to go through that very narrow gate. And currently the door is open and anyone that will can enter that house. But Jesus talks about one day that that door will be closed. For most people it's a day of the death, their death. When the Lord returns it will be permanently closed at the return of the Lord. But at that day it will be closed. And Jesus said in verse 25, once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But it's too late, isn't it? And he says, I don't know you. I don't know you. Second, a truth that Jesus uh, taught. First one is, 
few will be saved. The second one he taught is many who expect it to be saved, many who think their children of God are not. Many who totally expect it to be under God's grace and, and enter eternal life will, will not be saved. Verse 26. Then you'll be saying, we ate and drank with you. We knew you, Jesus. We even knew what you looked like. We were very familiar. We knew all about you. But that's not enough. It's not enough to know about Jesus. You need to have him in your heart. You need to commit yourself. You need to believe in him and trust in him. Not just know about him. See, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever trust in him, whoever believe in him, it doesn't say that whoever knows facts about Jesus, but whoever has him as their savior, they believe in him. They got a hold of him. And they said, well, we knew. We talked in our street. We knew about you. And Jesus, Lord, we heard and saw you do miracles. But he replies, I never knew you. Too often you have people familiar with Jesus. They think faith consists of just believing in facts about Jesus. Faith doesn't consist in believing about facts about Jesus. It consists in believing in Jesus. That he is the Savior. He is my only hope of salvation. Without Jesus Christ, I am a lost sinner. But I have trust in him and he promises me eternal life and he doesn't lie. That's what faith is. It's believing in him. The third eternal truth that Jesus taught, I'm taking them in the order, is there's two definition, uh, destinations. You either end up in heaven or you end up in hell. Both are real. One is wonderful, one is horrible. Jesus describes heaven very consistently in the Bible and hell very consistently. Heaven he describes as a wedding banquet, a wedding feast that the king uh, gives to his son. And you know, there's probably nothing more festive than wedding feasts. Isn't that true? And you're invited to this wedding banquet. I live in Stephen's Point, a lot of Polish. I remember as a kid, people, and I remember, used to love to go to Polish weddings. They always had such good chicken soup. <laughs> this wedding banquet is going to have a lot better than that. Because we're going to be sitting with the Lord and with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Jesus describes hell in painful. You'd be gnashing of teeth, weeping and sorrow. Will be regret because of missed opportunities. You will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's specifically speaking to the Jewish people who think, well, we're born children of God, we're born Jews, we're born children of Abraham. That makes us right with God. And Jesus says, no. You need to have faith in me. But you will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets of the kingdom of God. But you yourselves will be thrown out. People will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and take their place at the feast of the kingdom of God. The problem was they didn't give Jesus what he wanted. They thought being religious was enough. And he doesn't want religion. He wants you. He wants me. He doesn't want us just to go to a religious show. He wants a relationship that we have grabbed hold of him by faith and we trust him and he's in our lives. See, Jesus had a passion for souls. The problem wasn't God. The problem wasn't that, there, that God wouldn't welcome them into the kingdom. The problem was that they wouldn't come on his terms. Jesus was always about the Father's business. Next, Jesus tells about his death. He predicts his death. The Bible goes on. At that same time, verse 31, at the same hour, literally, the Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place, go somewhere else. For Herod wants to kill you. Kill you. These were not friends of Jesus. And they were not trying to help Jesus. And Jesus understood their motives and he understood what they were saying. They wanted him to return to Judea and to Jerusalem because the Jews there wanted to kill him. 
And Jesus was saying to them, today and tomorrow I must drive out demons, I must heal people, I must continue to preach the gospel, but it's not time. And then the third day, is he's using idiom, he's not talking literal language, he's not talking day one, two, and three. He said, but the third day, then there'll be a time I will return to Jerusalem. Because no prophet can be killed outside of Jerusalem. He said, don't tell Herod that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow. And the third day, he'll reach, I'll reach my goal. What was his goal? He had came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came not to be served, but not to uh, be served, but to serve us by giving his life a ransom for many. He was born to go to that cross. And what could happen could not happen in Herod's territory because God said long ago it had to happen in Jerusalem because that was the only place that a sacrifice could be given that was acceptable to God. And until that time came, Jesus said, I'm going to continue to do the work of my Father until the day I die. And the most amazing thing, even on the cross, didn't Jesus do the work of the Father? For the thief on the cross who repented Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. It shows us what's on the heart of Jesus Christ, doesn't it? Finally, as Jesus talks about his coming death, he's overcome with emotion. It's a failure. Remember, Jesus was God, but he was completely man, he was made, which means he had our emotions. And overcome with emotion, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who killed the prophets and so on those sent to you, how I have longed to gather your children together. See, the problem wasn't God. God longs for people to be saved. And he's done everything necessary by sending his son to go to that cross. I longed to gather your people. As a mother hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you are not willing. The problem is people. They're not willing to repent. They're not willing to come. The problem's never been God. Not as, God is not willing that any should perish. But they didn't love Jesus. This is what the, Jesus is hard. By the way, the problem was not a lack of religious activity in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a religious captivity of the nation. Act, religious capital of the nation. It was full of religious activity, full of, of fasting and, and uh, all kinds of things. But they didn't give Jesus what he wanted. John wrote, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right children of God. That's what's on Jesus' heart. He wants people saved. And that's what's still on Jesus' heart. It's amazing how often I've been in a council meetings or church meetings with elders and how few times we discuss, how few times people bring up the question, what can we do to lead people in our community to Jesus Christ? What can we do to save the families and children in our communities? And yet that's the number one question that's still on Jesus' heart today, isn't it? And, you know, we need to talk about those things. How do we pay for electricity? Uh, the church needs painting. The car is getting old. Uh, how are we going to pay for the pastor? That's pretty important. We need to talk about those things. But more important, anything that the church talks about is how are we going to reach out to the lost people in our community because we have people in our community who don't have a clue about Jesus Christ. Many, many of them know our name, but they don't know what he's done for them. How are we going to reach people in our community? Because God died for every single person in our community and the door is still open. And we spend so little time talking about that. I think sometime in my own life I had to be serious when I prepare and preach, I preach to myself too. How often I let less important things 
get in front of what's really important. How often I get distracted by other things rather than what's on the heart of God. If you take God's word seriously, you'll make sure you're a child of God. God doesn't really want my religion. He wants me. He wants me to trust him. For believers, if you take God seriously, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, what's on Jesus' heart needs to be on our hearts. It needs to be what motivates our life, what motivates our church life. Everything we do in the church needs to be calling people to Jesus Christ, whether it's ushering or even taking the offering. First Peter wrote, you are a chosen nation. He's talking to us. You are a chosen nation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possessions. And then he tells why God calls us, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. The job of the church is to pray, declare the praises of Jesus Christ who died for us, sent on the cross, rose from the dead, who calls us by and gives us this wonderful grace and forgiveness. We're to proclaim that. That's what the job of the church is. We're to tell people how wonderful this Jesus is and how great his salvation is. I heard this story from a, uh, I can't remember the name of the pastor. He was one I greatly respect. He's now with the Lord. True story, this happened to someone in his congregation. He was a businessman. And the businessman got on his plane and uh, all dressed up and he had to go to an important appointment and he thought, uh, well, I just hope I, he got an aisle seat and I just hope I can work or rest and I don't have somebody real chatty. So he sat down and pretty soon a little girl came, a little Down syndrome girl, sat down right next to him. And he thought, well, I wonder how this is going to be. And she was quiet for a while, and finally she said, Mr. 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 Do you brush your teeth? And the man was kind of startled. He said, well, well, yes, I brush them every day. Well, that's good because you won't get cavities. And she was quiet a little bit. And, Mr. Do you, do you smoke? Well, no, I don't, I've never smoked. Well, that's good because you won't get cancer. And then a while later, Mr. Do you believe in Jesus? The man smiled because he had been a Christian a long time. He says, yes, I believe in Jesus. I love Jesus. Well, that's good because then you have eternal life. And while this was going on, another businessman in a, a well-dressed suit uh, went through and took the other side, took the seat near the window, and near the side of the little girl. And you can guess what happened. Mr., 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 do you... Brush your teeth? And the man was equally surprised. Well, well yes, I, I brush my teeth. Well, that's good. You won't get cavities. Mister, do you smoke? Well, I did, but I, I stopped about 15 years ago. Well, that's good. You won't get cancer. Mister, do you believe in Jesus? And the man's face dropped. I... I I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I believe. The little girl turned over to the first gentleman and said, Tell him! <laughs> Is that something? Two story. Remember when we lived in Arizona? And my parents were nominal Christians. They took, my dad would say, he took us to church because it was good for us. And our daughter Sarah was a fourth grader at the time and my parents were visiting. And uh, we had a kind of a ritual of praying and saying good night. And so they were gonna go say good night to our daughter Sarah. And Sarah with tears in her eyes. Grandpa, Grandma, do you believe in Jesus? Because Jesus wants to see you in heaven. I couldn't testify to them like our daughter did. 
They were moved by your simple faith. Lord, may we have this childlike faith. Forgive us, Lord, that sometimes we act ashamed of you. Everybody around us, the world around us, is spouting off the most vicious sins as being okay. And we can't take a stand for you. May we have that childlike faith that we would take your words at face value and that we would believe it and do it. Amen. Amen. in your hymn book number 381 Heart the Voice of Jesus Calling 381 
Father, thank you for this congregation. Lord, we pray that you continue to lead the faith within church, that you would guide them, that you provide all for, provide for their needs, Lord. Uh, Lord, that you would continue to help them to uh, pastor Dick and that we continue in faithfulness to your word. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we want to pray for our country. Lord, we deserve your judgment. We've turned our back on your word. We've denied even that you have existed. We deny that you are the creator. We have little respect for your word in this country, Lord. We ask that you would not deal with us according to our sins, Lord, but that you would send faithful servants and churches to call people, that you would send revival, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, we pray for Ashley as she's uh, had surgery that you would keep away infection, that you would help her to deal with the pain, and that you would bring her back to health. Lord, we ask in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, thank you for Pastor Nick and his, and his wife and family, Father. We ask that you would give them safety as they travel, Lord, and that you would give them a time of refreshment today. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day in the beautiful weather. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, what a blessing to have grandchildren and great-grandchildren. We ask, Lord, for Christine, that you would uh, keep her safe. And for those two little babies uh, that are in here, you know everything about them, Lord, even though they're uh, not born yet, Lord. That you would give her a safe a delivery. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, we bring to you the unspoken request in our heart. We bring to you family and, and friends and we bring to you neighbors that don't know you, Lord. We pray that you would use us to influence them toward the kingdom of God, that they would come to know you, Lord. We pray for this community, Lord, that we would, this church and, and other godly churches, Lord, would reach out and be effective in bringing many to know you. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, everything we have, from our salvation to the shoes on our feet, is a gift from you. Lord, we just adore you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's receive our offering this morning. Oh, sharing of the peace. Sorry, I skip over things. <laughs> the peace of the God be with you all. And also with you. Thank you. 